Hey folks, how you doing? Steve Camboris here, otherwise known as Cambo Trout, and today is going to be episode two of the Blue Catfish Truth series. If you haven't seen part one of the series or my electro fishing trip with the Virginia Department of Game and Inland Fisheries, definitely go back check those out first because we do cover a lot of information in episode one of the series. Episode two is going to be on the Invasive Catfish Symposium. So the 2017 Catfish Symposium was a gathering of nonprofits, governmental agencies, and fisheries biologists and managers in the Delmarva area to look at the most recent science on the species and identify a path forward for managing the species. Because they're here now, we're not going to get rid of them. The question is, how do we manage them? How do we manage them for fishery? How do we manage their impact? So you're going to get into the organizations who were present, some of the findings from it. But for right now, let's go ahead and get to the video. In 2017, there was the Invasive Catfish Symposium. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to have links in the description as well so you can review that as at your leisure. They have PowerPoint presentations, links to the studies. So these conversations are extremely helpful, but if you really want to dig down in the details, you have links to all that as well. And you'll hear more detailed information because I gave like three presentations at that symposium. And there you, and there so you go. I, I've talked about movement there. I talked about the market, mark recapture density studies. And then a lot of the work that we, we did today. Now, in respect to the Invasive Catfish Symposium, mm -hmm. could you break, us, break it down for us, the parties that were involved and why this was brought together? Because I think a lot of times people aren't aware of how involved our fisheries biologists and our various authorities or various governmental organizations are in trying to manage these issues. So what kind of interests were brought together? What areas were covered, like Chesapeake Bay, down to the rivers through Virginia? Wh whose interests were, I guess, covered, expressed in that symposium? Absolutely. So uh, as Steve alluded to, there's a lot of different stakeholders in, uh, in blue catfish, okay, or invasive catfish in general, flatheads and blues. Um, these fish do not understand political boundaries. <laughs> they will go wherever they can distribute themselves to survive, right? Which is a lot of places. Which is a yeah. lot of places. Yeah. And so now they've made their way into Virginia, Potomac. Um, they've been there for a while. Uh, and now they're getting up into some of the upper bay tributaries mm -hmm. as well. So we're talking about folks from Maryland, uh, Delaware, right? We're talking about different federal agencies, other state agencies, and research institutions as well. Also, there's commercial fishing interests, which we'll discuss a lot here in a few minutes. And also, um, the angling community, which is really one of our main constituencies with DGIF. Mm -hmm. and, and those folks we care about very, very deeply. They're the heart of our, of our organization. Now, based on my reading from the notes at the symposium, here's a short list of those species people thought might be impacted. And you've already touched on a few. Yeah, oh yeah. The, the first one was white catfish. And it's clear in the Rappahannock as an example that they've pretty much been completely displaced. So is that accurate? Based on the, the what we just saw today, um, we had a handful of white catfish juveniles that we collected, but yep. in large part, uh, it was, again, 99% blue catfish. Exactly. And that's what we'll see in most other rivers. They're slightly more abundant in the Mattapanai River. Mm -hmm. uh, but in general, that's what we see as blue catfish as far as catfish composition. Uh, I do a fair bit of fishing up on the Susquehanna River. Okay. And in recent times, we started to catch a lot of blues up there and some pretty big, you know, 40 plus inch fish. Maybe not the tanks you see roaming the Potomac, but pretty nice fit, size, nice size fish. Mm -hmm. We're still catching a good number of channel cats, okay. but do you have any kind of visibility into studies that have shown displacement with channel cats or interbreeding between the two species? Uh, not necessarily interbreeding in a natural setting. Okay. I know there's some aquaculture uh, where they, they selectively breed those two species together, but um, as far as channel catfish goes, it's, it's likely going to be a similar story. I mean, we've had channel catfish in Virginia. They're non-native as well, um, but they've, they've also become displaced mm -hmm. as far as uh, the overall catfish community. It's a great point. I'm glad you said it. Like me growing up, I'm, what, 35 now? 
I it never occurred to me honestly before I started looking into this kind of information and talking to biologists. I think a fish like a channel catfish is non-native to the area. You know, the same goes for largemouth bass in a lot of these Maryland and Virginia waters. Oh yeah. So it, we we, we tend to accept as normal what we're born into. It's almost like a generational perspective. But when you dig into the weeds of this, you find out just how much we as humans have altered the entire landscape when it comes to these ecosystems. Yeah, and I, as I mentioned earlier, it, you know, these are degraded systems. So we have high erosion due to different types of land development in the upper watersheds. Um, we have industry uh, occurring as well. We have um, different urbanization impervious surfaces mm -hmm. water is moving faster and becoming warmer just because it flows across the landscape faster and as it flows across the landscape it picks up a lot of those fertilizer the nutrients and a lot of the uh, sediment and so we've had large-scale sedimentation issues up and down pretty much the, the entire coast of Virginia um, based on the river system so there's uh, different levels of development within each watershed, but we're talking about nutrification, we're talking about sedimentation as these large overarching issues that really impact the Chesapeake Bay. Now, you know, we had really high uh, freshwater flows last year. Oh, yes. Some of, the, some of the highest on record, if not the highest on record. Like the year previous as well was pretty high. It was, yeah, yeah we've had record rainfalls. Um, and that changes things too, as far as salinity goes. So uh, we can touch on salinity and how how those fish move and are associated with different water quality conditions as well. Absolutely. Oh no, we will definitely be touching <laughs> on that because what we need to understand is that yes, blue catfish are highly adaptable fish. They can survive in a lot of different areas. But if we really want to have an effective management paradigm, whether it's blue catfish or snakehead or any other type of, you know, invasive or non-native species, we need to understand what we're doing to the environment that makes it suboptimal for the species we want to keep and versus what it does to the environment for the species that we don't want to be there. Because otherwise, you can't effectively manage it. it you're, you know, it's, I guess it's like trying to fill a bucket with holes in it at, to, at a certain point if you're not caring for the environment itself. Yeah, so it's a you think of the ecosystem as a whole, and it's it's not always single species issues. Yep. There's a lot of parts, pieces to a pie, if you think oh, about yeah. in, in just your general statistics course. You have your pie chart, and you have the whole pie chart is 100%. Well, each slice of that pie, you could say, is a certain impact to, say, a native fish community. Yep. And it's hard to quantify how much... How much is that impact of blue catfish? How much is that impact of sedimentation How, and water clarity? It, it's, it's very difficult to quantify. That's why you have large overarching programs on the Chesapeake Bay, Chesapeake Bay program, mm -hmm. to, to look into those types of issues. Exactly. Which is where that invasive uh, catfish symposium came into play. It brought together a lot of the, the stakeholders to have those discussions. All right, folks, I hope you enjoyed part two of this series. In the next episode, we're going to get into the specific impact on a lot of different species that I'm sure a lot of people out there are worried about. Things like, you know, American shad, hickory shad, herring, Atlantic sturgeon, American eel, and probably the most concerning for people in the Delmarva area, the blue crab. All right, so we're going to get into all that. So two more things for this one video right here. First, call for pictures. What does that mean? Well, if you're one of those folks out there who loves fishing for catfish, blue cats, flatheads, channel cats, or even if it's exotic species, like you're fishing, you know, giant red tail catfish down in the Amazon or Piraiba, if you want to get featured in this series, go ahead and send them to me and I'll fit those in as best I can, you know, the limits of space and time at the, for, for a highlight reel at the end of each one of these episodes in the series. And the last thing I'll say is, if you enjoy this kind of content, if you enjoy my channel, Please like, share, and subscribe because the algorithmic changes they're making at YouTube, it's making it harder and harder for smaller creators to get seen out there. So if you like the material, you think it's worthwhile, please share it. All right. Other than that, folks, good luck on the water and 
Hopefully I'll see you in part three of the series. And you have a good one. Ooh, yeah. Woo. <laughs> I'm a snakehead man, but I love that pool, man. That's a big girl. Oh, she's tangled on the net with the hook. Oh, <laughs> That's not good. Okay, got her. Another big old dog.